Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, please, and open to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. Before we get started, uh, of course, tonight, keep in mind, in our, uh, in our church, there is a, uh, a host of different people at different levels uh, in their spiritual growth. At, at any given time, there are folks that are in our service literally recovering from some of the roughest times that they have. And let me say, you have, uh, you have done a, a monumental job on making some of those folks that are trying to make their way back, uh, making it a little easier, showing friendship and kindness and uh, just a, a smile and a, a simple, it's good to see you, or something along those lines that, that makes a difference. It does. And uh, because as, as someone's trying to crawl out of the, the hole that they've dug for themselves, and by the way, they have to. There's nobody that can pick them up out of it. The Lord Jesus is the only one that's going to help them to crawl out of it. But it's the fact that he says, okay, I will lift you up to put you on a solid rock. But in this instance, if you're going to grow to a point that you need to be, you're going to have to make your own way somewhat. And in that instance, I, I just want to say thank you again to you as, uh, as you are en enabling them to do some of those things. One by just helping us to keep the doors open. Honestly, the, there are folks that, uh, <laughs> the truth is, they, uh, there are folks, I'll tell you right now, uh, that have sat in our services before, and uh, whether they've gotten away from the Lord or something along those lines, and they, they have uh, found themselves on the other side. Other side of the, uh, the doorways, the walls, and things of that nature, and they have said, I, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with God, I don't want to have anything to do with, with God's people and things of that nature, but they're usually... There usually comes a day where they begin to, <laughs> like the uh, prodigal son, came to himself. And then he realizes that the, the greatest help that I'm going to get is going to be from God, God's people, and the house of God, and the principles of God, and the book of God. And, uh, and they, they drag their way back in. Uh, they wonder if they're going to be able to ever get back on topside, whether the light will ever shine on them again and things. And then they, they come in here, and you help laugh, and you help make the load a little easier on them. And, uh, and it goes a long, long way. It really does. And so uh, let me say for those that are trying to make their way back, they may not know how to say it, but thank you, church, for, for helping them to get to that point as they make their way uh, on the road. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 tonight, you and I are going to look at something that uh, is sometimes troubling to us, because the truth is, it is sometimes something that we haven't really asked for. And by the way, it is, it is not because we were disobedient, it was not because we have, uh, we have done those things that we shouldn't, the truth is, it's because we have done those things we should. And, uh, and we have seen the, the blessing of God, and we have seen God's favor, and we have uh, we, we, honestly, when we know that when we pray, God hears and, and something's going to happen. That's a, it's a wonderful place to be. But in that instance, we know that uh, even though it gets God's attention, it gets Satan's attention and he can't get at us to some degree. I mean, he tries, but the only way that he can get at us is if we kind of open the, uh, the hedge of protection a little bit, as Scripture says in, in the book of James, that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And entice. So when we are drawn away somewhat, uh, he, he comes after us. But the truth is, you say, you know what? I, I, those things don't trouble me as badly as it is. But I want you to take note of something tonight as that Paul had addressed. And he, he, he addressed it because he knew that it was going to be relevant for others also. Because otherwise he wouldn't have made mention of it. And that's the reason why God put it in Scripture. And the way that he described it, and the way that he gave a little bit of ambu ambiguity to it, um, means that it can apply to you and I also. So notice if you would please in chapter number 12 and verse number 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, 
For I will say the truth, but now I uh, forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, <coughs> that it might depart from me. So I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about a thorn in the flesh. All of us know what a thorn is because we have had the occasion uh, to be uh, involved with some of those little stickers at some point. In the, uh, in the summertime, even here at the building, now how they came up or what, I don't know. Uh, but the little, uh, I call them little sand thorns. And, uh, and we have some that are right outside the, the front of the, uh, the little carport area there. When I was in school, the thing that we would do is if you got them by just the uh, uh, old, uh, the little, uh, what do you call it, stem, you could pull them out. It wouldn't stick you. But if you threw them and stuck them to your friend, oh, they would stick so well. And, uh, and it would stick through their shirt or their socks just enough to, ow, you know. And if you're not careful, if you go to reach for all of them, you get a handful of them. And, uh, and you know those are not comfortable at all. Just those little burrs, those little, not enough to just, you know, just throw you out of commission. It's not a wound that's not going to, unless uh, it, there's something that can get festered along those lines. But it's, it's that thorn, it's that little irritant, it's that little... That little, uh, that little splinter that happens to get in your hand. And you deal with it, but, you know, if you move just right, it kind of hurts. And it's like, i got to get that dug out. And, uh, and then you have to uh, uh, work on, on getting it out. But it was a, a thorn. That thorn is there because uh, in the process of doing your daily task or in the process of doing whatever you're doing, uh, it just happened to catch you. You were doing what you were supposed to do. Maybe you were working or whatever the case, and you ended up getting that little splinter, that little sticker, that little thorn, if you would. And it's there, and you've got to do something with it. Because even though it's not going to completely stop you from living, it's just that constant irritant. And in this instance, we see here that uh, Paul realized a couple things about it. And uh, it, but uh, literally the thorn in this particular instance, as you begin to look at it, it, it literally means a constant irritant. It is that little thing that just kind of annoys you and that just pricks at you just a little bit and just sticks you at a time when it's just kind of inconvenient, you're not expecting it, but it is a reminder because it caused that shooting pain and all of a sudden it gets your attention again. It's just irritating. We see here in verse number 7, the Bible says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was, I want you to notice this first word that is noticed there. It was given, given. You see, the thing that sometimes we think is, well, if the devil's bothering me, it's because he's just after me. I want you to understand that sometimes a thorn is given, and when it's given, it, I, I, it, it was stated like this to me one time. If Satan constantly is messing with you, it could be that God okayed it. No, it's always that God okayed it. And so you're doing what you're supposed to do. In the process of doing what you're supposed to do, all of a sudden you, you manage to get that thorn, that little irritant, and it's there. What it did for Paul is it reminded him that uh, his position and, uh, in Christ was reminded of that because in the process it was given, he realized where it came from. And because of that, he, the Bible says he came to the Lord three times. Now, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But to try to describe what it was for Paul, we, we don't know. Scripture doesn't give it, and he doesn't give us specifics about it. I think it's kind of interesting because in verse number 8 it says, for, for this thing, and he doesn't state exactly what it is. The reason why it's not stated is so that you and I can apply it to us too. It was a thing. It was a thing he had to deal with. And so in that instance, he stated it here, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. In the process of that, some have said that it was possibly after he had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus, it created such an eye problem that, that uh, there on occasion that uh, he had such difficulties that, uh, that it was really problematic for him. 
reason for some of that is because in other instances, he had somebody that was actually writing uh, the letters for him. There is even one point he said, you see what, uh, what a large letter I'm writing to you, whether he was referring to the length of it or actually the size of the, the characters that he was writing out. Uh, we, don't give, we don't have clarity on that, but oftentimes people thought that he may have had a, an eye issue that troubled him all the time. Maybe it was very unsightly. Maybe it was something that, that, uh, that it troubled him a little bit. Dr. Rice, many times, he'd wear his glasses way down on his nose because he couldn't see very well. And, uh, and because of that, uh, he would oftentimes, uh, you know, have a tendency to, uh, it, it, it bothered others more than it bothered him. And he'd have to look at people like this. And he'd look at them. <laughs> and they was like. And so, uh, and, and in that instance, it could have been an eye problem that, uh, that, that was created that, that Paul had. We don't know. Another instance, it was told to us that there, were, uh, there was a group of people called the Judaizers that, that followed him and caused him difficulties and everywhere he went. It could have been the fact that he stated in one point uh, that all had forsaken him. It could have been just bouts of loneliness that he had. But whatever irritant it was, whatever that troubled him, whatever that bothered him on, uh, on occasion, he came to the Lord and he said, I, I, Lord, I, I'm serious about this. And I understand something. He said, I came three times. Paul, in this instance, realized that when I bring something to the Lord the first time, he hears what I say. That's why, it's so, that's why it, it makes such an impact on us when it says, I came three times. He said, when I take something to the Lord, it's not a small issue. He said, when I bring it to him, I, I have full intention that something is going to happen. And so when I brought it to his attention, nothing happened. And the Lord gave him answer in verse number 8. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul finally, after the second time, I'm sure he came and said, Lord, this, this is troubling to me. This wears on me. It, it takes added energy or it, it frustrates me or it brings me anxiety or it causes me difficulty or it, it causes a strain on what I think the ministry uh, is. And Lord, if you take it away, how much easier would it be? And he began to rationalize and he, he brought his petition to the Lord the second time. The Lord gave him the same answer. My grace is sufficient. In that instance, he came one last time and the Lord told him again, look, my grace is sufficient. So at that point, Paul had to realize, I want this taken away, but God's answer for this is grace, not this removal. Sometimes you and I may get a thorn in the flesh because they do show up. It's that little irritant that we would like to get away, that we would like to get away from and we would like the Lord to remove. Whatever it could be, there's no way for me to name all of them. Maybe it is bouts of, of, of anxiety. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's uh, just uh, thoughts of uh, of just uh, insufficiency or whatever the case may be or, or I'm not worthy or whatever the case. I don't know. It could be something that's physical, whether it's something that is troubling to you on occasion. It could be something that uh, is uh, just something that's unsightly, whatever the case may be. But in this instance, the Lord comes. And the truth is, we'll probably get to heaven someday. And those folks that we thought, uh, uh, yeah, we just sang a song tonight. Someday the silver cord will break, and I know more. Uh, this, this life shall see, if I recall, the, this shall be. Or, uh, uh, but Fanny Crosby wrote that. We know very clearly that Mrs. Crosby was blind. And uh, in that instance, we don't know if she ever saw the, the, uh, the color silver. We don't know if she ever saw any of those things. But she did say that one day I'll see him face to face. Where, her, uh, where it was like, Lord, if I could only see, how much more could I do for thee? And if I could only see how much easier it would be to pin these things down. And if I could only see. But the Lord said, no, my, my grace is sufficient. Because your weakness is made perfect in my strength. And in that, we begin to realize that sometimes when the Lord deals these things out, when he gives them to you, we say, Lord, I, I, I don't want this. He says, I know, but this is going to be something that will help you to understand grace. Because in that instance, he says, Paul, uh, you're, very, you're very zealous, aren't you? Yes, I am. And when you get zealous, you sometimes forget how that zeal will affect somebody, don't you? Well, it, it, it's zealous. That's what I'm supposed to be. He says, yeah, but you need to understand that sometimes they don't need your zeal. They need your grace. 
And in that instance, Paul was realizing that this is given to me not for just my detriment, but for the ability for God to get glory from it. He said, so if I can have an infirmity that will bring God's glory and will allow others to see God in his display, notice what he says when it comes to verse number 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. This morning, somebody made comment about one of our members and uh, there, some of the physical limitations that may be there. And I said, <laughs> I, I, I started to say something, and they said, it's amazing because they're such an inspiration. And I said, well, no more said. God gets the glory from all of that. Because they get to realize the fact that God is the one that makes up the difference. Because when we find ourselves in a weak place and when we find ourselves at a point where we continue on, where others would have an excuse, would have a reason to quit, would have a reason to say, I'm going to set these things aside. I don't feel like this. I don't want to do this. And it's, it, 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 it's embarrassing to me. But instead, they go ahead and step forward and God gets the glory from it. Paul is saying that's exactly what takes place because it was given so that my glory would be seen. And in that instance, Paul realized that, okay, God's glory is seen. I am allowed to then display grace that God could use. And so in that instance, look, I'll glory in the infirmity. I will take pleasure in it. That's hard for you and I to accept sometimes. The difficulty that we face, and the truth is, when we get to heaven someday, we'll probably see how that everybody had something that troubled them in some manner or another. We just didn't know. We may get to heaven someday and, and we'll have plenty of time, if you want to call it like that. And then we'll sit there and, and somebody will stand up and say, I dealt with this on a regular basis, but nobody knew. And you and I will look and say, I would have never thought that. I only thought, and what we saw was two things in particular. We saw the display of God, his glory, and we saw the grace that was extended through their weakness. God provided strength. And in that instance, they were able then to be a portion of the display of God, the glory of God. <laughs> Here, Paul is saying this. We must realize that sometimes those thorns are given. They're given. And it's given, and the thing that we don't like about it is this. Sometimes, notice how it was given to him. Because as we read verse number uh, 7, it goes on to say, "...and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations..." There was given me a thorn in the flesh. This is the part we don't like. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. God had a plan for you and he let Satan be the deliverer. You, you understand that Satan is nothing more than a pawn for God to push around. I know you and I think for a second that, oh, you know, he's troubling me. He doesn't do anything outside the boundaries of what God is okayed. He never does and cannot. He is a defeated foe. He will never have redemption. He is not a, he, don't, don't misunderstand me. He is not a foe that you and I can take on on ourselves by any stretch of the imagination. We have got to have the word of God, uh, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood and, uh, and God our Father to deal with him. But in that instance, we have all of those things. That's why he said greater is in you than he that is in the world because Satan is a defeated foe and it bothers us when all of a sudden God says, I'm going to let him bring you that, that delivery package. And all of a sudden it shows up on our doorstep and we think Satan's just here to bother me. But it was okayed by God and he was allowed to show up. You say, well, why would that happen? I'll give you a prime example. Have you ever heard of the man Job? Job and everything, and of course, you know, you know the, the I, I am reminded of that over and over again. Satan is standing there, and uh, they come up, and they say, you know, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And all that, that would be the, the, the thing that most folks were saying to him. His cattle was taken, his riches, his health, and all of those things, his children. But the only thing that wasn't taken was Mrs. Job. She was over there. Job, why didn't you take his wife? Satan said, or Job, uh, you know, what happened? Satan says, uh, just leave her alone. I know what I'm doing. So in that instance, it's like he had everything bad happen, and she stayed. So what does that say? Oh, I ain't going to go there. So, but in that instance, we see here that all of a sudden what took place was something that you and I would not have chosen. 
And by the way, a thorn oftentimes is not something that we have chosen, but it is something that is given. I know we like the good gifts and perfect gifts for from above. We learned that from James. But do you understand that sometimes that thorn that comes your way and my way is a gift that is given? And we would not look at it as that, but because it would be an infirmity to us. And you let Satan bring it? God, how can this be right? God says, I know what I'm doing. And in that instance, he shows up. And all of a sudden we say, well, we have a reason to hate this because Satan brought it. Okay, you may do that, but it was still given by God. But the position that Paul realized was this. Notice the very last portion of the verse in verse number 7. Lest I should be exalted. He said, so I recognize my position. God needs to make sure that I keep myself on, a, on an even plane. Because Paul realized that the very last statement that he made, lest I be exalted above measure, because the very next verse says, for this thing I, thought, I sought the Lord thrice. He says, when I come to God, God listens to what I say. He said, God hears my prayers, and God has oftentimes moved in miraculous ways to preserve my life and make my ministry abundant and make a, a, give me an open door of opportunity. He said, so when I came and the answer didn't come, I, it really bothered me, and I couldn't understand it. He said, so I came again. He said, and the same answer was given, that my grace is sufficient. He said, and so I came the last time. And, uh, and like I said before, when Paul began to pray and he asked the Lord something, he knew that I'm not asking because I don't think it's a need. I'm not asking because I, I want it solely just for myself. He said, I, I think it would affect the ministry. I would affect the work of God. But God said, no, I want you to understand something also, Paul. He says that as he, we come to verse number 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Because he said, I'm the one that came. It affects me. He said, so my grace is sufficient for thee. I'll take care of the ministry. I'll take care of the work. I'll take care of the future. And I'll take care of you too. And what I'm going to give you is going to be the thing that is needed to accomplish that task. And it's going to be grace. If I removed it, it would not bring me the same glory as if you had it. So all of a sudden, Paul said, okay, if that's the case, if my thorn, if my infirmity brings you glory, it's difficult for us to realize that, but that's what he goes on to say. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometimes that thorn shows up. Satan brings it. God's okayed it. We don't like it. We, bese we beseech the Lord to take it away. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you grace so that my glory will be displayed. And in that instance, we say, but, but Lord, wouldn't your glory be on display better if you would remove this? He's, and the Lord says, no, but my grace will be sufficient for thee. And in that instance, Paul goes on to say then, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, verse number 9. He says, uh, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, he says, because the power of Christ then rests on me with this infirmity, if it's taken away, some of God's power is removed too, then guess what? In verse number 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I wonder how many of us could honestly say, Lord, thank you for the difficulties that I face. Thank you for the pain that I have to endure. Thank you for the circumstances that I have to be in. Lord, thank you. Because through all of these things, I don't know how, and I don't know how you receive glory from it, but you clearly do, because I've asked you to take it away, and you, you've just said my grace is sufficient. So, Lord, <coughs> if this is what is needed so that your power would be evident, I'm just going to thank you for it. And in that instance, it changes the whole demeanor, because Paul has given this whole display of what's going on, and where he goes on to say in verse number 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. He says because then God has to make up the difference. And when my weakness is evident, then God's power is on display. 
because everybody can see that it's not me that's doing it. It's God that's accomplishing things. Look, I, I don't understand sometimes how God does what he does. I just like how he does it. That's all. I just like to be a part of it. And how it's, it, it's one of those I was mentioning even this morning to somebody. I said, look, I, I don't know. I, I know the recipe for growing a church because I've been around church builders. Now, I'm, I'm not excellent at it by any stretch of the imagination, but I know some of the things that, that uh, makes for, uh, for church growth and things of those, uh, those natures. And so because of that, I want to try to continue to use that recipe. And I don't know what ingredient makes it all happen, so I don't want to change the recipe. I know folks have oftentimes come and they've said, I don't like how you do this. I've said, sorry, can't help it. Don't care whether you like it or not. All I know is a recipe that works. That's all I know. And in that instance, you may like pancakes, and if you do like pancakes, you know the recipe to make them good. Some of you can make excellent pie, and you can make excellent crust and cookies, and I'm throwing out an invitation to let me try any of them. But uh, in that instance, you know something and how it's made, and in that instance, look, look, there's no necessarily just you know the recipe and what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to act like. And uh, in that instance, I know uh, there's been a couple different times. My Aunt Reen, now, she, she's gone now, but she made the best dumplings that you have ever eaten in your life. I'm not kidding. I, there's no way to describe them. Your tongue would literally begin to sing the Hallelujah Chorus on key after eating these. I'm not kidding. And, uh, and I told Mrs. Whitworth, I said, look, <laughs> my Aunt Reen, she makes, she makes the best dumplings you've ever eaten in your life. They will just melt. You ask anybody in my family, they say, oh, yeah, Aunt Reen's dumplings, they just melt in your mouth. And they did. And they did. And so I talked about them, and she called my aunt. And uh, <laughs> it, it was not Aunt Irene. That was not her name. Her name was Aunt Reen. And, uh, and so Aunt Reen, you know, she called my aunt and said, and asked her, you know, uh, Aunt Reen, how, how do you make these? And uh, are, do you have the recipe? <laughs> and she said, oh, honey, what you got to do is you got to put flour in here, and then you put a little milk in there till it looks like this. And then she didn't have a recipe for it. She just had made them and knew what it looked like. And so uh, it, as, much as, as much as Mrs. Whitworth has tried, and she does well at doing a lot of things, and, uh, but that's just one of those things. There's not a recipe in that. And uh, Aunt Reen had the, had the recipe because it was how it looked and a little bit of this. And uh, you know what I'm talking about. You all have a, a job where you have, you have done it so regularly that you know what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to operate, and what it's supposed to do. And if you, and you recognize the very second, oh, it's a little too thin. You recognize that, oh, there's, it needs just a little bit more of this. It needs just a little bit more of that. Or you taste it and it needs a little bit more of that. And you know what that is. But you know if you don't operate according to the recipe that you know what it's supposed to look like, taste like, and act like, it is not going to do what you wanted it to do. And it's not going to taste like it's supposed to taste. God comes to you and I and says, I know the recipe for a good and productive life. I know what it is. I don't need man's help. They've messed up everything that man put his hand to. I, may, I put him in a perfect garden. He can mess that up. I gave him a perfect wife, and he messed all of that up too. And, uh, and so in the whole thing, God gave perfection. Man has a tendency to mess it up because we try to change what God has done. And in that instance, you, you and I are going to find out we're going to come up on the short end of the stick. It is not going to accomplish the task that we want it to do. But the reason being is this. We think we have the idea. We think we have the answer. But there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Have you... <laughs> Maybe you fellas remember that. The first time maybe your wife tried to make biscuits. Do you remember? Oh, it got quiet. Oh, yeah, you do remember. You're a wise individual not to say, oh, yeah, I remember that. Maybe you remember the fact that it wasn't as edible as you was hoping it would be. I'm trying to be kind here. Or maybe you say, no, I, from, a, from a young person, you know, uh, she was able to make biscuits and things. Now I'm telling her. I'm, not t I'm telling the truth here. I'd watched my mom make gravy I don't know how many times because I'm standing there with my mouth salivating waiting for it to get done. And uh, I knew what it was supposed to look like. I knew how she did it. I watched it numerous times. And I can remember that uh, <laughs> it, it was so funny. You, you ever found out that later on that you ate things that were weird? I didn't, I didn't know that anything that we ate was weird, but I can remember one time there was a, a family that had begun to come to church and uh, and the the family they were uh, they were expecting at the time, 
And uh, so when the, the lady went to the hospital, had the baby, their youngest boy came to stay with us for a night or two. And mom fixed what she always did. And uh, she fixed pork chops and fried potatoes. And uh, so when uh, <laughs> I, I still remember the little boy, and I still remember when he went back home, and he told his mom that he ate fried potatoes. And she said, what? He said, I ate fried potatoes, mom. And then she said, what are fried potatoes? And, uh, and so she came up and asked mom, said, my, my son kept saying that he ate fried potatoes. What, uh, what French fries? Is she said, no, it, fried potatoes. And uh, she said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I just, I'd take the bacon grease and put it in a frying pan. And I'd cut up the potatoes and let it fry and then put some salt and pepper and different things on that. And she goes, you fried it in grease? <laughs> I'm thinking, is there any other way to fry things? <laughs> you know, in bacon grease? I didn't know we weren't supposed to eat them like that. I'll tell you what, nothing tastes better than fried potatoes fried in bacon grease. Amen? I'm telling you. Mom made them for breakfast, for lunch, and dinner, and we ate them like we were going out of style. But And uh, in that instance, we were as strong and healthy as bull oxes we were. But uh, in that instance, you know, you begin to realize that. And so when, when we had gotten married, I don't guess I don't guess you had ever just made gravy like I had seen it made before, and so after I had fried the uh, the bacon, I just left the grease in the pan, and then took some flour and put it in there and began to brown it, and put some salt and pepper and things in there. And she's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm making gravy." You're doing what? I said, "I'm making gravy." You know, I've I've seen it done hundreds of times. I know what it's supposed to look like, and even though I tried, I couldn't make it taste like Mom made it taste, but. In that instance, and so you know, I've watched her do it I don't know how many times, and I, I poured the, the milk and the water and things in there and got it all, and so it started to bubble up and do what it was supposed to do and uh, poured it over the biscuits that were there. We had so much because I didn't know, didn't know how to measure things out. Mom always had a great cast iron skillet. There, we were always plenty hungry just for her and I. I made way too much. <laughs> and we took it next to, to Craig and Ann's, didn't we? And uh, Craig came up that night, and he always used to call me Dudamus. I said, oh, Dudamus. He said, that was the greatest stuff I ever ate. What, what was that? I said, that's gravy, man. And he grew up in New York, and so he said, we never ate anything like that before in my life. I said, we ate it all the time. <laughs> Just incredible. Sometimes God knows the recipe. Since God knows the recipe, sometimes we don't like what goes into it. And we're puzzled. You fry that grease? God comes to us and says, I, you, I need to give you a thorn? I have to have a thorn? God said, yeah, that's, that's going to be the part of the recipe to make things do what I need it to do. And we fuss with him. But God knows the recipe. Paul here in this instance, as he come down to verse number 10, he made the statement when he said, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. He said, when, when folks don't like to be around me, when I'm reproached because of just who I am and what I talk about, in necessity, in other words, his lack, when he had to do without. In persecutions, when people come against me. In distresses, he said, when, when all of a sudden I realize that I'm in trouble because of the winds, the waves, the circumstance, the weather. He goes on to say, for Christ's sake. But through all of those things, he says this, for when I am weak, then I am, in, then I am strong. Then am I strong. He says, because when I realize my frailty promotes his abundance and promotes his abilities, that's exactly what people need to see. They need to see that God is able. He said, so the infirmity that I have, the infirmity that you have, the infirmity that we all carry in some manner or another, guess what? His strength is made perfect in weakness. And because of that, that infirmity that you and I carry is not to harm us, to slow us down, it is for us to depend upon God and let others see two things, his glory and grace that is needed. Those are the two things. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I do ask that you'd please help us today. Sometimes those thorns show up and we don't like them. They're uncomfortable. They're very irritating. And Lord, we, would, we just want them removed. But Father, your power is seen through them and your grace is made sufficient in them. And so, Father, we have to realize that sometimes those things are there and we need to just glory in them and take pleasure in them. It's hard for us to do that, Lord, because we find ourselves frail on more than one occasion. 
And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to realize that those things that we would count as loss, you count as an abundance. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to follow your will, do those things we should for your sake. And God, I do ask that you'd please help us to be a stronger people dependent upon you because of it. We ask now, of course, for your help. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. I'm going to ask Mrs. Whitworth to play just a couple verses, that's all. But in that instance, it could be that maybe you're carrying something right now that is an infirmity, that is a thorn, it's just a constant irritant. It's just something you'd like to shake and leave behind. But it doesn't seem like it goes away. It just always appears. Maybe it's God just saying, you know what? My grace is sufficient. <clears throat> and my strength can be made perfect in your weakness. And in that instance, you can realize that when you are weak, then he makes you strong. Maybe it's just something that God says. It gives you the ability then for me to have another connection with you in a different manner. Because those that would refuse the thorn would refuse those things and, and be upset with me if I gave it to them. I need somebody that would continue to press on even in the midst of the difficulties that they face. Because you depend on me and you depend on what I need to get done. It's just another way that God allows us to have a unique connection with him. Is it comfortable? Sometimes not. But it's always drawing us closer to him.